Hallelujah. God is a mighty God. Hallelujah. And there is nothing that he can't do. That, if, if I just got up here and told you that, then that would be enough for me to communicate that thoroughly and properly to you. I don't know how I can make you understand that, but just t- to tell you that I am a living, breathing example that God will come through and he'll come through right on time for you. Hallelujah. God is the author and he is the finisher. He knows how to get the job done every single time. Hallelujah. And so I've come to encourage somebody that's holding on to God today. Hallelujah. Don't let go. Don't let go because he will come. He will make a way for you. Somebody say amen. Amen. Praise God. What an awesome privilege to stand in the presence of the Lord today. And we want to uh, we want to thank our visitors for being here today. And we appreciate you. And uh, we want you to feel right at home. I'm ready to preach the word today. Are you ready to receive the word? Those watching us online, are you ready to receive the word? And that is a question that you need to deal with right now. Because if you're not ready to receive it, hit the pause on your video right now. And go spend a couple minutes with God. Because his word needs to fall upon the properly prepared ground in order to do what it is intended to do in your life. And so that's why we come into the house of the Lord and we prepare ourselves before we get to the word. God's word is quick. That means it's alive and it is powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword. It can even divide down to the thoughts and the intents of your heart. Wow. You mean God knows what I'm thinking? Yeah, we're going to talk about it today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Exodus, the 34th chapter. Exodus, the 34th chapter, is where we're going to start today. And if you're reading your Bible through, then you are uh, in Exodus right now, and you are, uh, or, or you're probably past that, I guess, at this point, but you have gone through Exodus recently. And I won't ask you to raise your hand. But do you know that there's revelation even in Exodus? (laughs) Hallelujah. And so, you know, sometimes we say, oh, that's the Old Testament. Can't we just let that just rest a little bit? But no, the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. Hallelujah. And there is revelation in the Word of God. Exodus, the 34th chapter and the 33rd verse says this. And till Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. I want to preach to you about a veil. The title of my message is Thinking Beyond the Veil. Let me back up just a second and give you some context for this scripture because, you see, Moses got alone with God and he came to a place in the presence and the glory of Almighty God that he was changed and he came into contact with the people of God with a different countenance than when he went up to the mountain. He went up to Mount Sinai. But you may not understand and you may not know the context of where this happened, where the change in his countenance took place because you see we are such an impatient people we want to get along with God for about 30 seconds and have everything done and taken care of I'll never forget reading Sylvia Pennington's book about coming into reconciliation and the understanding of reconciliation and she just didn't understand she just didn't get it she knew what she felt when she was around gay people in church and she felt drawn to them but she just didn't understand she said lord i don't get it as far as i can see in scripture all i see is what everybody's always told me and and it's just a bunch of 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 negativity and it's a bunch of judgment and it's a bunch of things that i can't look past and so lord i don't know what to do i don't see anything different and you know what she did she got down beside her bed in her bedroom and she said lord I'm not getting up until you give me a revelation. 
She said, if I starve to death while I'm waiting on you, I'm not getting up from this place until you come and give me a revelation and show me the truth of your word. And she said, I made that bold proclamation and nothing happened. (laughs) There I was. I would imagine her stomach was probably growling. (laughs) Nothing happened. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Mm, Lord, did you hear me? But after 30 minutes passed, The Spirit of God filled that room and gave her a revelation that changed her life and put her in a place of ministry that influenced thousands to come to a place of reconciliation. And so here's what you need to know about this encounter with God that Moses had. This was after the plagues of Egypt. This was after the parting of the Red Sea. This was after... He had had the burning bush experience. This is after the people of God needed the provision of the Lord and manna came down out of nowhere. This is after God had provided uh, water coming out of the rock. This is after all of the miracles, the quail coming in to feed the people of God. This is after his first trip up to Mount Sinai. This is after he had received the Ten Commandments. This is after the golden calf experience where he had come down and seen the rebellion of the people of God. This was after he had been alone with God for 40 days and 40 nights and fasted for the entire duration. This was his second time up to Mount Sinai. And his second time alone with God, fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Some of you didn't even know that that happened twice with him on Mount Sinai. But something happened on his second time up the mountain. Something happened when he got alone with God. And there was a change in his countenance. Can I tell you that he came down and the glory of God shone upon him. And this is even after he had come to a place, Brother Dennis, where he said, Lord, I don't care about any more miracles or any more blessings or any Red Sea experiences. But God, if there's one thing that I have to ask of you... Would you show me your glory? Just show me who you are. Let me see your face. And God said, nobody can see my face and live, but I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. This is after God had taken him and hidden him and caused his glory to pass by. And he began to see just the trail of the glory of God. He had a desire to see the glory of God. This is after all of these experiences he went up one more time to Mount Sinai and God visited him in a different way this time and it changed who he was can I tell you that if you're not spending time in the presence of God you cannot be changed if you're not coming to a place where you say Lord I'm not going to visit you according to my own dictates and my own time schedule but I'm here to wait on you I'm here to seek your face I'm here Lord because I need you I know you don't need me but God, I can't do anything without you. And I'm just going to wait until you come. I'm just going to wait until your glory fills this place. And I'm going to wait until you change me. He came down from that experience and his face shone so brightly. The Bible said that the skin on his face was shining so brightly that people couldn't even look at him. Can you imagine some folks filing in out of the prayer room one Sunday (laughs) and people just coming in late for whatever reason, but coming in late (laughs) would come in and say, oh, I left my sunglasses in the car. What's what's going on? I don't understand. Am I ha- am I stroking out or something? I, I don't get it. Am I smelling burnt toast? No, I'm not smelling burnt toast. I don't understand what's going on. The, the, it's too bright. You guys are going to have to do something. You see, there was a veil that had to be placed over Moses' face because the people that had not been with God, the people that had not sacrificed 
something in order to experience the glory of God could not look upon the glory that was emanating from Moses. It will cost you if you want to have an experience in the glory and presence of God. He said, seek me while I may be found. He said, if you want to draw near to me, then I will draw near unto you. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things are going to be taken care of. Moses got himself to a place where he said, Lord, I know you can provide. I've seen water come out of the rock. I've seen manna come down from the sky. I've seen quail come in from nowhere when we were about to die because we didn't know where our provision was coming from. We didn't know where our miracle was coming from. But Lord, I've seen you part the Red Sea. I've seen one miracle after the next. Lord, I know that about you. But I've come, Lord, not to seek your hand any longer. Not to seek your blessings any longer. Not to seek the benefits that you can load upon me. Not to seek financial breakthrough any longer. But I've come just to get along with you and to see your face and to seek your glory. Do you see the difference? Hallelujah. And that experience changed Moses in such a way that the people that had not been in a place of seeking God couldn't even look upon his face. And so he put a veil over his face. And he had to have that upon his face so that he could even speak to the people. Look at Hebrews, the 10th chapter and the 19th verse. Having therefore, brethren, boldness, Paul said, to enter into the holiest or the holy of holies by the blood of Jesus. Verse 37, and Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Here's what I want you to see today. Hallelujah. You see the veil that was put over Moses' face. Uh, it, It is a symbol of a separation between the spirit of Almighty God and the glory and presence and nature of God and all the people who are walking in the flesh all the people who are walking in the flesh let's back up to that scripture in Hebrews said having brethren boldness to enter into the holy of holies they sang about it earlier there was a veil put in place One of the instructions that Moses received when he was building the tabernacle is there's going to be a place for the Ark of the Covenant to sit where the presence of Almighty God will dwell. But not just anybody can go in and experience the Holy of Holies where God dwells. Not just anybody will be allowed. And there's going to be a veil that is placed over the entrance of that special place called the Holy of Holies. And nobody is able to go in there except by special appointment and special anointing and separation and training and if you go in there without the training and without the permission and without doing the very letter of the law then you better be prepared to be struck dead and there were people that would uh, uh, that would uh, uh, fear going into the holy of holies because they feared God you know, in mega churches today, you don't hear much about fearing God anymore. But I'm afraid of God. I'm afraid of God. You see, the church today wants to bring God down to the lowest common denominator. He's my little buddy. He's the one that's going to get me a parking place where I want it. He's the one that is is going to just, you know, uh, just do everything that I want him to do. No, he's looking for a bride. He's looking for somebody that loves him for who he is, not because he can bless, not because he can do things for you. He's looking for somebody, and he's looking for somebody who will look at his face. If you're in 
in love with somebody. You want somebody that loves who you are, not what you can do. He's looking. He's searching for somebody in this day and hour who will love him enough that they say, God, if you never bless me again, if I never get any of the things that I wanted, if there are never any plans that I had that come out the way that I thought they should, if I never go where I thought I should or do the things I thought I should, Lord, I want you because my heart is beating for you. I breathe because I love you. You are everything to me. And Paul said this, in him we live and move and have our being. Hallelujah. Actually, I believe that was Luke that said that. But he's, look, Jesus is looking for somebody today who will love him and seek his face. He's looking for somebody that said, I want all of Basilea that I can get. I'm going to seek. And if I have to find uh, that there's a price to pay, I'm going to say uh, with my whole heart uh, that I'm sold out. I don't need the details. I don't need to read the fine print because I've been bought with a Christ, I am, am his because he paid for me. Hallelujah. And so I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Hallelujah. And so there was a veil that was put over the face of Moses. And there was a veil that was put over the opening of the Holy of Holies. But can I tell you, something happened when Jesus took that cross upon his back and he marched up to Calvary, even stumbling under the weight. He had been beaten for you. He had been ridiculed in your place. Can I tell you that nothing that happened to him was just that day. There was not one thing that he took upon him that he deserved, but he was the spotless, sinless lamb slain from the foundation of the world. No, he was being spat upon because you deserved that. He was being ridiculed because that's what you deserved. He was under the weight of that cross with the wounds upon his back for you. Now separate out everybody in all of time and even everybody sitting next to you today and just let's shine a light just on you for a minute. Because if God had never created anybody else on the face of the earth, Jesus still would have carried that cross up to Calvary with your name written all over it. And so Jesus carried that cross and he shed his blood and he allowed himself to be nailed upon the cross. The Bible said that he could have called 10,000 angels to come and to rescue him. Don't you know he could have ended all humanity with a snap of a finger, with a word from his mouth. Everything could have been obliterated. No, but he decided I've got to die for Linda Atkins. I've got to die for Gloria Morgan. I'm looking right now down through time and I know that Liz is going to need a savior. Doris needs me to stay upon this cross and he made a conscious decision hanging upon that cross to die for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then something happened when Jesus finally came. The the physicians tell us it probably took about three hours of agony upon the cross for him to come to this place. But verse 37 in Mark 15 says that Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. He was all God and he was all man at the same time. If you think that he didn't suffer agony for you, then you've got something else coming. With a loud voice, he gave up the ghost. And I want you to see the very next verse, what took place. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. Can I tell you that Jesus gave you access 
success with everything that he did upon Calvary and upon the cross. That blood was shed for your salvation. Those stripes were shed for the healing of your body, your mind, your soul. Can I tell you today that by his stripes we are healed today. Hallelujah. And the healer is right here in this house. I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that he's the healer of my soul. He's the healer of my mind. He's the healer of all of my diseases. Why? Because of what he did that day. But can I tell you something that was not anticipated. Something that nobody expected. Something that really wasn't understood at the time transpired as he gave up the ghost. The veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom giving access to everyone that will seek the presence of the Lord look with me at 1 Corinthians the third chapter 2 Corinthians the third chapter sorry and the 13th verse it says this going back to Moses And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away, in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away. In Christ but even unto this day look at this when Moses is read the veil is upon their heart verse 16 says this nevertheless when it shall turn to the Lord the veil shall be taken away now if you're wondering why is Paul talking about this in 2nd Corinthians the veil that is still upon the hearts and minds of those who will not seek the face of God you see the veil symbolized the very flesh of Jesus Christ the Word of God we've been quoting it a lot around here in John the first chapter it said in the beginning was the word you can't get any further back than the beginning in the beginning was the word and the word was with God the word was God And the word in verse 14, it says, became flesh and dwelt among us. And so you see, because God chose to dwell among man, the word of God said that he had to put a veil in place between himself and all of fallen humanity that could not look upon the face of God. And that veil was the flesh, the body of Jesus Christ. He put on a veil just as Moses put on a veil so that he could walk among the people that needed a savior, the people that needed to be redeemed. Hallelujah. But there's a problem. You see, the veil was rent and access was given. But Paul said this, even today, the veil remains on some. Even today. The veil of blindness remains on some. And I've preached to you in several messages, even a three-part series last year, I preached to you about blindness in the church. When you begin to look at Romans, you see blindness that is given to Israel, that Israel is blinded because they didn't receive the truth of the revelation of who Jesus was when he came to earth. The truth stood and looked them in the face And you know what? They turned aside and they said, no, we're not going to acknowledge the truth. And because of that, blindness fell upon Israel. But can I tell you that in that very same chapter in Romans, I believe it's the 11th chapter, it said that all of us are grafted in. And as many as believe in Jesus Christ are the seed of Abraham. Do you think that the blindness that was upon Israel doesn't translate upon the church? If we are the seed of Abraham because we believe in Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Paul said those who are Jews are really the ones that have faith in Jesus. Wow. Mm, Are you sure, Pastor? Yeah, look it up. 
we're grafted in. What do you think that means? And let me take it just a second for those who, are, who might be confused as to why the church would be going through the tribulation. Oh, why would that be? It's because the church is grafted in to Israel. And the tribulation in prophecy is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Who's Jacob? Jacob is Israel. Now, lest you mark me a post-tribulation heretic, I've come to tell you that the pre-tribbers got it right and the post-tribbers got it right. Sort of. Because the church who is blind, there's another name for them in the book of Revelation, the church of Laodicea. Come on, somebody. Look it up in the third chapter of the book of Revelation. The church of Laodicea, who Jesus said is blind and wretched and naked and lukewarm. Come on, somebody. Jesus said that I'm going to spew them out of my mouth and it's going to be into the tribulation. You see, the church is going through the tribulation, but there is a bride who is making herself ready, that is tuning up her ear and paying the price and walking in holiness and saying, Lord, I'm separate separating myself from the world and I'm getting ready to leave this place. I've got my garments on and I'm keeping my record right. There's a bride that is getting ready for a, a sound that she's never heard before. A bride to be who is going to step through the open door and say, Lord, I'm ready. And when the trumpet sounds, her feet are going to leave the ground. And we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah. There is a bride that is coming up out of the church of Laodicea. There is a bride that is not appointed to wrath. There is a bride, as a matter of fact, that is in the way of God's plan unrolling and unraveling, unfolding. Did you know that you're in the way? If you're in the bride of Christ, you're in the way. If you're seeking Basilea, you're in the way. And literally, the tribulation can't begin until you get out of the way. That's right. Hallelujah. I'm getting ready to leave this place. Hallelujah. And it could be any moment in the twinkling of an eye. You're not going to have time to think about the things that you're going to leave behind. You're not going to have time to get your priorities straight. You're not going to have time to love his return because the word of God said he's coming just for those who love his return. My advice, if you're scared of it, you better read the word. You better get yourself right and you better learn to love it. You better learn to watch. Come on, somebody. The punchline of nearly every teaching and parable that Jesus gave is you better watch. Because in a moment that you think not, that's when I'm coming back. Hallelujah. But here's what I need you to understand today. There is still a veil that is upon the hearts and the minds of those who are in the church today. And I've come to tell you that it doesn't have to stay there. Jesus said even to the church of Laodicea, he said, you're blind, you're wretched, you're naked. You say to everybody that we're rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. Everything's going just right. But you don't even see how blind you are. But here's what I want you to understand. Even as he is rebuking Laodicea, he's giving hope. And he's saying, here's what you need to do. You need to go and buy gold tried in the fire. You need to go and purchase a robe of righteousness. You need to go and get some salve and put on your blind eyes. Because the door is open right now. But it's not going to be open very much longer. Hallelujah. Why do I address Laodicea? Because I love Laodicea. I love Laodicea with all of my heart. My brothers and my sisters, these are Holy Ghost filled, blood bought people who are walking around in willful ignorance. Willful ignorance. It breaks my heart 
And until Jesus takes me off of this earth, when the trumpet sounds, if there's any hope while the door is open, I'm going to preach it. If you get sick of it, I'm still going to preach it. Because if there's hope that somebody somewhere can watch this video or somebody can come in the doors of this church and hear the word of God and be stirred and say, Lord, I want to go through the veil. I'm, lo I'm no longer happy being on this side. You granted access to the truth of the Spirit of God, the word of revelation that is being poured out as long as there is breath in this body. I want the church of Laodicea to hear the word of God today. Hallelujah. The veil is firmly in place upon those who are walking in the flesh. It remains untaken away. How is that possible? We've seen this scripture a couple of times recently. Isaiah the 55th chapter verses 7 and 8. It says this, let the wicked forsake his way. Well, that sounds about right. I know I've got to clean things up and get right with God if I want to be saved. Look at this closely, though. It says this, and the unrighteous man, his thoughts. Wait, wait, that wasn't in there last time. That's not what my church told me. My thoughts are my own thoughts. I'm going to, uh, those, those don't belong to, no, you've got to forsake your thoughts. Let me finish this scripture. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I want to stop there and then we'll get to verse 8. This is not talking about somebody that's brand new. This is not talking about somebody that just met the Lord. This is talking about somebody that needs to return to the Lord. And the way that you've got to return to the Lord is by forsaking your thoughts. I want to say this because God has loosed the spirit of revelation. I, I, I'm standing here just speaking the truth. I'm not here to put myself on a pedestal. You can check it out. Re, uh, just, just look at the messages. Just, just take a look at the messages over the last two years that God has given to those behind the pulpit of this church. God has loosed the spirit of revelation upon my life. Why? Because because I got alone with God one day and I said, Lord, I'm not going anywhere until you speak to me, until you reveal yourself to me. And you know what happened? The Spirit of God filled my bedroom and I had an experience that I've never had before. You can mock it. You can ridicule it. But I know what I experienced. I know that the Spirit of Almighty God has revealed His Word to me and it's ongoing. The windows of heaven have opened up and can I tell you that every revelation that God is pouring out in this day and hour is completely in sync with the word of God it is forever settled in heaven it will never pass away Jesus said let me make this clear. There is no private interpretation of prophecy, the Word of God said. And God also, the Word of God said that we prophesy in part. We know in part. The Spirit of God told me, even in the midst of this experience, I'm not going to give all of it to you because I've got other people. I've got other seekers that are going to get alone with me, and I'm going to speak to them. I'm going to take the veil away from them so that they can see. And when I begin to speak, there are just going to be a few who will at least be in a place to listen. But I, I said all that to say this. I've never received a revelation ever once in my life. And I've been receiving them since I was a teenager. Since I was about 14 years old, even younger, I've been receiving revelations through the Holy Ghost, through the spirit of revelation. 
I'm nothing special. God just put his hand on me. And he said, if you'll seek my face, I'll do something with you. If you'll, if you'll separate yourself away from everybody else, if you'll pay the price, if you'll get away from everybody else, I'll do something with you. And I said, Lord, here I am. Do something, God. Hallelujah. But I've never received one revelation except I've had to forsake my thoughts. But God, that's not what everybody taught me growing up. And God said, well, you can have them or you can have me. You can have all the stuff that's, that's steeped out of tradition, or you can have the truth and the spirit of truth alive in your life. There's never been one revelation that I've ever received that I haven't had to let go of some stuff. I haven't had to forsake tradition. I haven't had to forsake. I've never received anything from God except that I've had to give something up. And so I'm, I'm here to challenge somebody. So somebody's, somebody's watching me on video. Somebody is here in this place. And I want you to understand that you're holding on to something. You're holding on. And God said, I, I've called you to seek me. And you've said, Lord, I want revelation. I want you to speak to me. But God is speaking this to you. Even in this service today, you're not willing to let go of the things of the past. You're not willing to let go of the things of on which you've staked your, your own reputation. You see, the Jews, some of them saw that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh, and they believed upon him, but they loved the praise of man more than they loved the praise of God, and they would not turn away from the tradition of the law and their synagogues and the, 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 the leadership and their place of respect in ministry. You know why most preachers just preach reheated messages over and over and over again with nothing new coming through in their entire ministry? It's because they're not willing to pay the price and walk away from the prestige of what they've built over their years of ministry. They can't get themselves to a place where they say, I'm going to buy the truth because I, don't, I want the truth more than anything else. But there's somebody in this place today or watching me online that you do want the truth and you're wondering, God, why won't you speak to me? Why won't the revelations come to me? Why won't you confirm these things to me? Mm, I feel the Holy Ghost speaking to somebody right now because somebody has been watching these messages. Somebody has been sitting under these messages and you've been waiting for confirmation through the Holy Ghost. I already told you that none of these things are by private interpretation. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of revelation and nobody has a corner on the Holy Ghost. Jesus said you're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost is come up upon you. Can I tell you today that the reason that there is a roadblock in your path is you will not pay the price to sacrifice your thoughts to God. But Lord, all you can think is, but Lord, if, if that's true, then what am I going to do? What are, what are my friends going to think if I embrace that? If that's true, I've, I've always believed this and I, I figured this stuff out. You know what? Your ways don't mean anything to God. And your thoughts don't mean anything to God. I want, we're getting a little deep here. But I feel in the Holy Ghost today that there is a roadblock that is about to be taken out of the way in somebody's life. And the flood of the spirit of revelation is going to be loosed in somebody today. Hallelujah, the veil is about to be taken away because somebody is getting ready to say, Lord, these thoughts, God, I'm going to forsake them. We already talked about the, the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for you. Mind, body, soul, and spirit. He paid for you. Did you know that that means your thoughts don't belong to you? <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Forsake your thoughts. The word in Hebrew, forsake, azab. It means this, depart from. To leave behind. To abandon. And finally, to loose. God is calling us to abandon our thoughts. Come on. Can I just tell you that your thoughts are not supreme? God said, my thoughts are so high above your thoughts. As far as the east is from the west, as far as high as the heaven is, that's how high my thoughts are above your thoughts. And your thoughts, I want you to consider this because you see, the, the way Satan works is he wants, he has a partnership with the flesh. He works in perfect lockstep with the flesh. And can I tell you, the things of God are spiritually discerned. The carnal mind is enmity against God. And you can't even understand or even receive the things of God in your flesh. What does the flesh mean? Can I tell you, they sing it today. I'm living this life just to live again. You may look at me and you see this body and you say, well, I recognize that that's my pastor. But can I tell you, when you look at me, you're not really seeing me. You're seeing my vehicle. You're seeing something that God has allowed me to walk around in for a few years that's going to allow me to go through my interview and my placement test that's going to take me to my position in all of eternity. I have a body, but I am a living soul that is going to live forever somewhere. I am a body, or rather I have a body, but I am a soul. How shallow can you be after all? You're going to sit there and obsess on the color that my vehicle has been painted. By the way, this color's baked in. It's not going anywhere. But you're going to, you're going to cause yourself to be all caught up in ethnicity and color and race. Guess what? When the trumpet sounds, there's no more race. There's no more ethnicity. You are focused on body parts of somebody, whether they're male or female, you're focused on gender. Guess what? When the trumpet sounds, there's no more male or female. And by the, the, the power of the Holy Ghost, I want to quote you Galatians 3.28. The word of God says, somebody hear me today. Galatians 3.28, by the power of God, receive this today. The word of God said, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free or male and female. If you're in Christ, then you need to be thinking beyond the veil. This veil of flesh is so inconsequential in view of eternity. And yet we spend all of our time praying for the things of the flesh. I'm talking about thinking beyond the veil. I've come today to tell you, I'm challenging somebody today to give your thoughts to God. Here's what I need you to understand. Your thoughts are not sacrosanct. Your thoughts are not privileged. Your thoughts are not God. Far from it. Your thoughts are a simple, meager attempt of your soul to process information through a fleshly brain. Think about that for a second. Your soul will never have Alzheimer's disease. Your soul will never have to go in and out of the house three or four times before you leave because you keep forgetting things. Your soul is going to never leave a gallon of milk at the check stand and drive all the way home. Why do those things happen? Because you're thinking through a flawed, fleshly mechanism. I'm talking about thinking through the veil because the bride 
is the part of the church that says, I'm tired of spending all my time. You see, we, we're in an interview. This is an interview. This life, the, the book of James says it's just like a vapor. Just like a vapor. Just here, and just like a vapor, it's gone. When you look in the face of eternity, this is an interview. Somebody taught us that recently. This is an interview. And, and so here we are in the interview. But can I tell you, we're spending so much time trying to get everything perfect in the interview. We want everything to be comfortable right here in the interview. We're not even thinking about our place in eternity. God, I, I just need everything just right. I don't want to be disappointed. I, I don't want my feelings hurt. I don't want any, any kind of sickness or any discomfort or any inconvenience. Don't get me wrong. God is the healer. God is the provider. But do you see what I'm saying? God is looking for those who will lift up their eyes and look up from the things that are down here and begin to think through the veil into the place of eternity. God is looking for somebody who is tired of of worrying about vehicles. I'm talking to a pastor today. You've been preaching so much about the flesh. You've been preaching so much about what I look like and my body parts and my sexuality. Don't you care about my eternal soul? Because my soul is not gay. My soul is not straight. My soul is not male. It's not female. It's not black. It's not white. It's not Asian. It's not Hispanic. But my soul is made in the image of God. It's fearfully and wonderfully made. Hallelujah. And it's going to spend eternity with my bridegroom. I'm getting ready to lay this body down. If I die before the trumpet sounds, I'm going to leave this body behind or when the trumpet sounds I'm going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye somebody hear me today the devil is trying to drag somebody down back into the things of the flesh but he that the son has set free is free indeed you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free hallelujah hallelujah I'm sick and tired of the devil coming in trying to steal the revelations that God has poured out in this time. I'm not having it. I'm standing in the truth of the word of God. I'm stepping through the veil into the place of the anointing of Almighty God. Hallelujah. I didn't get here overnight. I didn't get here unscathed. I didn't get here without having my heart broken. I didn't get to this place of stepping through the veil without having my life turned upside down. But can I tell you, I've got to do what God has called me to do. I don't care what I have to leave behind. I'm going through the veil where the holy of holies is, where the presence of God dwells. Hallelujah. Hallelujah thinking through the veil I've got to forsake even my own thoughts did you know that once in a while the devil will come in and give you some influence in your thinking you better you better get used to doing warfare right in it right here why do you think that the the the, the 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 armor that God has made available to you starts with the helmet of salvation because the devil will come in he'll come into your dreams He'll come into your subconscious. He'll come in and he'll begin to influence you and he'll come in. But here's what I need you to understand. You say, well, I don't know. How can I tell between when the enemy, how can I tell when a demon has been dispatched to begin to influence me? Can I tell you that the Prince of Peace doesn't bring turmoil, that the Prince of Peace is never going to bring fear, that the Prince of Peace is not going to bring condemnation. Jesus said this, I came into this world that the world not may be saved not so that I could bring condemnation I didn't come to condemn the world if you're hearing from God you're going to feel free he that the son is set free is free indeed you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free plain and simple end of story shut the book when the enemy comes in, you don't feel free. 
you feel condemned. You feel tangled up. You feel worse than you did before. You got this so-called revelation. Here's what I want you to understand. That just as God is pouring out the spirit of revelation in this day, in this hour, there's also a prophecy being fulfilled seducing spirits have been loosed to bring false doctrine and manipulation and all of these things that bind and bring people into a place further away beyond the veil further away from the veil on this side and keep them from stepping through into the true presence of God there is a spirit of deception that has been loosed in this day and this hour because Jesus is getting ready to come back Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Look at 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Casting down imaginations. Keep the camera on the scripture for a second. Casting down imaginations. Did you know, I don't care how high and exalted you are, a man or woman of God, there's going to come a thought that doesn't agree with the Word of God once in a while. As a matter of fact, there may even be thoughts that are put upon you. Is God real? What? How can I think that? I've been healed, I've been blessed, I've, been, I've had miracles, and yet you'll have those corrupt thoughts. Is God real? Is his word that he's poured out and revealed to us, is that genuine? If you're going to forsake your thoughts, you're going to have to bring your thoughts. Look at this, casting down imaginations, casting down imaginations, casting down imaginations and every high thing. What is that high thing? It might be the bishop of your church. It might be somebody in your family. But if it's a high thing that is exalting itself against the knowledge of God, you better bring it into captivity. Every thought, every thought, say it with me, every thought, every thought, bring it into obedience obedience captivity to the obedience of Christ who do you think you are that you would put your thoughts above the word of God how dare you stand in the audacity of thinking that your mental thought and acuity and intellect puts you in a position to say that's not the word of God God is bigger than you and you're going to stand before him one day and give account heaven and earth shall pass away but Jesus said my word will never pass away I'm calling upon the people of God to abandon your thoughts for the thoughts that the Spirit of Almighty God will bring to you. Revelation is not figuring something out. Think about that for a second. Revelation is not sitting there and figuring something out. <laughs> Do you really think God needs your brain power to help Uh, come on no he said my thoughts are so far above what you can even comprehend you poor little thing I've given you about this much truth <laughs> just about that much and here you think you are this high mighty lifted up thing that's just you're getting revelations that don't even exist in scripture so you're gonna go just put scripture aside you're just going to lay scripture aside because look at me. I'm just rising up in this day and this hour. Yeah, God knows how to slap you right down. I'm calling upon somebody under the sound of my voice to repent. Repent. Let the wicked man forsake his thoughts and return to the Lord. 
God is not finished with you. He was never finished with you. You exalted yourself, and it is a prophecy of the end time that they will be worshipers of the creation more than the creator. You're worshiping your own thoughts. You're worshiping your own creation of doctrine. I'm ready to step through the veil. But we speak the wisdom of God, verse 7, in a mystery. This is 1 Corinthians 2, 7. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. God hid things from you. Why? So that he could turn around and reveal them to those who would seek his face. The hidden wisdom which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Look at verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen. That means it's never happened before. Nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Verse 13 says, which things also we speak, not in the words, pick this up, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Look at this, verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Don't try to figure out God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. I believe God is calling for those who will lay their intellect down, lay their education down. Nothing wrong with either one of those things. I believe in education, and I like to be around smart people. But you're never going to get where you need to be relying on those things. Paul said this, there's going to be a church who is ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's time to think beyond the veil today. Hallelujah. Satan is obsessed with the flesh, but God has simply said, I'm not even looking at it. Not even looking at it. You can spend all your time concerned about the flesh. Do I look like this person? Am, am I, you know, all the things of the flesh. You can spend all your time doing that. But God said, I'm calling you to come up higher. This flesh is just for a moment. It's just for a moment. What are you going to do when you don't have the flesh to immerse yourself in anymore? I want you to take a look at your prayer list. Some of you keep prayer lists. And I want you to begin to evaluate how many of these have to do with the here and now and my flesh and being comfortable during the test. How many of these things are going to make a difference in my eternity or in the eternity of somebody else? It's time to think beyond the veil. That only happens when you say, Lord, here are my thoughts. God, I gave my heart to you. But I just thought I could keep my thoughts. I thought I could just keep this little kingdom. God wants your thoughts too. Hallelujah. That sounds like brainwashing, Pastor. Well, if you say that, I know you mean it ugly. But guess what? I want to be washed in the blood of Jesus. I want my heart washed. I want my soul washed. I want my spirit washed. 
And guess what? I want my brain washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. If you want to call me brainwashed, then hallelujah, I'm going to wear it as a badge of honor because his ways are higher than me. His thoughts are higher than me. His plans are better than I could ever come up with. God is going to come through for you. Hallelujah. And he's got a plan for you that blows your plan to pieces. Hallelujah. Rise above the shallow places today. It's time to think beyond the veil.